Hey guys, it's Mr. Candy back with yet another evolutionary video. This one's going to be talking about the origin of species and how species are created. Now, when we talk about speciation, we, we talk about the origin of a new species. And there's basically two ways in which it happens. Anagenesis, which means, if you look over here on the right-hand side, it's where you have an accumulation of her heritable changes over time to go from one species to another. Then you have cladogenesis, which is a basically a branching evolution, a budding of a new species from the parent species, and it continues on and on. There's some kind of diversity there. All right. Now, how and why do new species originate? Well, usually they originate because there is some type of geographic or reproductive isolation. Either they're separated from like species by a barrier, physical, such as an ocean, a river, a mountain chain, or reproductively, they're unable to create viable offspring. So, we're going to talk about some of these. Now, when we talk about reproductive isolation, we have we break it down into two two categories: prezygotic barriers and postzygotic barriers. Now, there are five prezygotic barriers that we need to know. Um, there's a habitat, behavioral, temporal, mechanical, and gametic. Uh, prezygotic barriers. Now, we're going to go through each one of these real briefly on the next couple of slides. A habitat isolation would be when two species may live in the same habitat, I mean, the same environment, but they, or the same region, I should say, but they are separated by the habitat in which they live, such as this particular type of snake. One species of the snake lives in the water in the region, and the other one lives on land, which prevents the two from mating. Another example would be lions and tigers. You know, even though they could create a hybrid if they were allowed to mate, they oftentimes don't mate in nature because lions live in the grasslands and tigers in the rainforest. Temporal isolation is the second one, and this is species breed, breed at different times of the day, year, seasons, and therefore they don't they, they have no attraction to mate during the I mean other times. It's a, basically a reproductive isolation in which they can live in the same regions, but because they um, choose to mate at different times, they're not viable. An example are these two skunks here. Um, behavioral isolation is a unique behavior pattern or ritual isolates the species. For example, the blue-footed booby down here at the bottom. The way it attracts its mate is, it, you know, it, it, such as the picture on the left, it sticks its foot up in the air and it turns its head away from its mate, I guess trying to show that it is um, not interested when it really is. But that is its behavioral isolation. That's what attracts its female. It wouldn't attract other animals, so it prevents them from mating with other animals. Now, something else unique about the booby, um, they actually lay a poopy, <laughs> a booby poopy, um, nest and that's where they lay their eggs so it's kind of unique and there are other boobies on the island i think there's red-footed boobies and one other type of booby on the galapagos islands um, but anyway behavior would be a, a third one a fourth one would be mechanical isolation now mechanical isolation is whenever morphological differences prevent them from mating together such as you know look over here on the, the right um, even closely related species of plants and flowers often have distinct appearances. So they're going to have different pollinators. So even though these two flowers are very distinct, I mean, closely related, one is being pollinated by a hummingbird and one is being pollinated by a bee. So it's going to be impossible for them to mate since the same uh, pollinator does not come to both. Mechanical isolation is whenever the genitalia of uh, Species don't fit, do not fit together. A uh, great example is is these d damselflies, or we might call them dragonflies in our area. Um, and if you look at the dragonfly penises down here at the bottom, um, each one of them are different. I mean, it just makes sense. They're not going to fit into the genitalia of other species of other sex. Excuse me, of other species. So this prevents cross uh, fertilization. So these are all prezygotic events. Now. The fourth, fifth one is gametic 
isolation. And this one is when the sperm of one species is unable to penetrate or fertilize the eggs of another species. Either a biochemical barrier where it's unable to penetrate because they often fit like a lock and a key. The enzyme of the sperm is specifically made for the egg. Or it's chemically incompatible. Whenever the sperm enters into the female reproductive tract, it's instantly killed. So it doesn't have any way to survive. All right. Now, the second type of reproductive isolation is post-zygotic barriers. And there are three of these. Reduced hybrid viability, viability, excuse me. Uh, reduced hybrid fertility and hybrid breakdown. And I'm going to go over each one of these very briefly. Reduced hybrid viability is when genes of different species, parent species, may interact, but it impairs the hybrid. What I mean is that the hybrid may be weak, it may not survive, it may be smaller than normal, it may be frail. It's just not a viable offspring in, a, in nature. The second one is reduced hybrid fertility, and we know this classic example of the horse and the donkey mating to create the mule. Um, it creates a infertile or sterile organism. Now, if you look down here at the mule, the mule has 63 chromosomes, where the horse has 64, the donkey has 62. It makes sense. The horse gives it um, 32, and the donkey gives it 31, and you add those together, you get 63. So why can't they make... Uh, why are they sterile? Why, why do they have gamete production uh, problems? It's because they have an odd number of chromosomes, so meiosis in hybrids is going to fail to produce normal, looking, normal gametes. I mean, they're not going to have an array, I mean, exact copies of gametes, okay? The third one is hybrid breakdown. Hybrids may be fertile and viable in the first generation, but oftentimes after you continue to mate them, they become even less sterile and less, and they become more feeble. Um, this is a problem that we run into sometimes with GMOs. But just realize that it's because as it goes on, it just continues to break down and degrade genetically. All right, now there are actually two modes of speciation. There's allopatric and sympatric. Allopatric is one that I think is everybody should have mean. Allo means other. So other country. So allopatric is whenever two, a population is separated by some type of geographic barrier, a river in the picture over here to your right, or a mountain chain, or a fence. That would be allopatric, and this makes sense to us, I hope. Sympatric is when, same country, this is when a species evolves, even while the parent species is still around. Um, and we probably associate this with maybe the, there are certain... Um, Certain ones of a population that are able to occupy a niche, a different niche than the parents did. And they just prevent them or they stop mating. So eventually you have this new species arriving in the midst of the old species. Now, rate of speciation is currently, you know, debated. And there's basically two types, Graduali gradualism or punctuated equilibrium. Now, gradualism is the one by Darwin and Liel, Linnell. Lyell. Um, gradualism, uh, if you remember, is when it gradually evolves over time. Punctuated equilibrium was talked about by Gould and Eldridge. And punctuated equilibrium is, says long burst of inactivity um, that climaxes into short burst of activity where you have evolution occur. So let's look at these. Gradualism is this. It's going to slowly change into two species over time. You're going to have an accumulation of a lot of little small events. Punctuated equilibrium is when you have time is going to go by and all of a sudden you're going to have boom, long, I mean, short burst of change. So there's two ways in which it can occur. Now, something you need to remember is evolution is not goal-oriented. It's not going toward a goal. You know, the environment is what's dictating which ones survive. And evolution does not create perfect organisms. You know, evolution is not survival of the fittest. It's survival of the ones that are just good enough. They're better than what is there in the, previously. So, you know, keep that in mind. All right. I hope this helps you, and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon.